Good afternoon, and thank you for tuning in to today's webinar. With us today is Mary D. Shahid. Mary is a member of Nexon Pruitt's Charleston office. She has an extensive administrative and regulatory practice. She frequently brings or defends challenges to permitting decisions in the SC Administrative Law Court. She has handled numerous appeals of administrative decisions before the state's appeal courts. Before joining Nexon Pruitt, Mary served for a decade in the General Counsel's Office of the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control as Chief Counsel of the Coastal Permitting Office. There, she advised multiple permitting programs, including the Office of Ocean and Coastal Resource Management, the Bureau of Water, the Mining Division, and the Solid Waste Management Division. Since leaving DHEC in 2002, she has represented landowners, utilities, real estate developers, industry, and local governments in permitting and compliance issues arising from regulation by DHEC, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and zoning and land use authorities. Mary received her undergraduate degree from Vanderbilt University and her JD from the University of South Carolina School of Law. She has been listed among the best lawyers in America since 2009 and recognized in Chambers and Partners USA in South Carolina in the area of environmental law. In today's webinar, Mary will guide us through the processes of dock permitting and the issues that may arise. And now I'll turn it over to you, Mary. Thank you. Hopefully I'm handling the technology well and everybody can see uh, my presentation. And I'm gonna speak to you today about dock permitting, and I make a distinction between dock permitting in the eight coastal counties and dock permitting statewide based on the various different regulatory programs and regulations that apply first in tidal water and then apply in freshwater. Um, my emphasis is on tidal areas because that's generally the dock permitting procedure that is more complicated. Um, but you can get docks all over this state. We have multiple lakes and rivers, and I intend to address all aspects of dock permitting in the state, realizing that not all of you focus on coastal real estate. Um, why would this be a topic of interest to you? You know better than I do um, how much water access adds to the value of property. This is an area west Ash Ashley in the Charleston, in Charleston County, city of Charleston. And um, it's an old neighborhood, probably from the 60s or 70s. It's North Bridge Terrace. And right now it's a hot neighborhood because um, it's close enough to the peninsula, but far enough that you're not aggravated by the peninsula. Um, and it's got good schools. So it's a very hot neighborhood right now. But if you looked um, at my source for valuation, which is Zillow, you'll see that the waterfront lots off of West Battery Lane, um, those are valued between a million and a million six. Now this is really good water access and that's always something you have to evaluate. This is water access that goes directly to the Ashley River and the Charleston Harbor. This is called Orange Grove Creek and it gives you 24 hour access through every tidal stage. The properties across on Chelwood Circle that do not have waterfront access are actually half of the value of the waterfront properties. So they're in the range of between 400 to 750. Um, maybe they're smaller properties, but they're certainly much larger lots. Um, so it's possible. I had always heard that water access in coastal areas could give you at least 25% more value, but what I'm seeing now is it might be closer to 50% more value. So the question is, does water access double the, the value of your property in any given neighborhood. Um, understanding docks, you, you need to understand, first of all, when we're talking about the value that's added, how much an existing dock costs and how an existing dock can add more to the value as opposed to starting anew with a new permit and a new dock. I think my figures are, are conservative in the sense that I think docks could probably, with lots of bells and whistles, cost well over $100,000. But the driving factor in dock cost is the length of the dock because it's about 100 foot, about $100 per linear foot. So a 300 foot walkway, which is a relatively short walkway actually, is gonna cost you at least $30,000. Then you've got all the other components of the dock, 
found a little illustration here that will help us discuss the components of the dock. Um, the walkway, and these, these <laughs> not to get too much into the weeds, but these are important because the regulations address individual components of the dock. So when we talk about a walkway, we're talking about the connection from the existing upland property. When we, um, the walkway extends to what they call a pier head or a deck, um, but the most common term for it is pier head. The pier head sits on pilings and with the aid of a ramp leads down to the actual place where you moor the boat, which is the floating dock, which does not sit on pilings. There's fixed structures. They'll refer to fixed structures, the pier head and the walkway, because they're on pilings, and then floating structures, and the floating dock is not a floating structure. Another common fixed structure is a boat lift, and a boat lift is balanced between pilings. Um, so those are the ter that's the common terminology when we're talking about docks. So dock construction is regulated. Um, why is it regulated? It's regulated because we're talking about balancing public and private interests. And we're talk talking about utilizing property that doesn't belong to us, that is not private property, but from which we attain a very significant private benefit. And so you gotta identify what are the public interests that need to be protected. And the, the federal agency, the Corps of Engineers, and the state agency, the Department of Health and Environmental Control, those are the agencies that are charged by law to protect that public interest. On the federal side, we'll talk about the Corps of Engineers. And what's interesting is when you probably think of the Corps of Engineers, you probably think about freshwater wetland regulation because you run into upland and wetland issues all the time as you're trying to market and sell property. Well, the Corps regulates wetlands through what's known as the Clean Water Act. The Corps regulates docks through a much older act from the 19th century called the Rivers and Harbors Act. So the, the public interest that the Corps strives to protect is the protection of navigation, the public interest in navigation, navigable waters. The public interest that the state agency protects relates to the public trust doctrine and the state's interest in tidal marsh and the pub, well, the state's proprietary interest in tidal marsh and the public's interest in the use of marsh and navigable waters. So that's why you get complex regulatory frameworks over what seem to be relatively simple structures serving the simple purpose of trying to you know, give you a place to put your boat so you can enjoy the water. But anyway, um, I've, I've dealt with permitting in South Carolina's lakes. That's kind of complex because all of the lakes are privately owned either by the core, um, that lake, gosh, what is it, up by Clemson, I can't think of the name of it now, in Oconee County, that was a federal water rediversion, water resource lake, and that's owned by the Corps of Engineers. Lake Murray, as we know, it, it's a utility lake. There are other, it's owned by SCE&G. There's other lakes owned by Duke Powers. It's Duke Powers. So you have to deal with the owner of the lake, and their shoreline management plan, their set of regulations. You have to deal with DHEC because it's a water of the state. DHEC regulates it under the state navigable waters program. And you have to deal with the Corps of Engineers because it's a water of the United States and they want to make sure there's no obstructions to it. Tidal areas, Corps of Engineers through the Rivers and Harbor Act and DHEC Office of Ocean and Coastal Resource Management implementing the coastal restrictions on the use of tidal properties. And tidal creeks, a little bit easier because the Corps' focus isn't as detailed as it is on larger water bodies, but, it, but you deal with the Corps and DHEC OCRM in those areas. Um, so these are what I've identified as what I think are topics of interest in the buying and selling of waterfront property. And you need to hold me to it at the end if I don't address all these. Um, first of all, regulations, understanding how many entities can regulate docks and how those regulations can conflict and the liability that 
you can inherit as a purchaser if those regulations weren't followed. The regulatory process, that's a very important part of the of the transaction because if your transaction's contingent upon some permit approval, uh, you gotta build in enough time. You've gotta uh, look at some due diligence issues around uh, the dock. You've gotta try to create a paper trail for the dock. Um, you gotta look at what's on the ground and make sure it hasn't changed materially from what was permitted. If you if you have a transaction that might be contingent upon re receipt of a permit, you need to understand the opportunities for that permit to be challenged. That's true statewide. Any DHEC decision can be challenged, but it seems to happen more in the coastal counties um, because of all the public interest in public marsh and public waterway. But the challenges can be expensive and they can be time consuming and they can be complicated. Um, the, the time frames for approval depends um, on whether you get a general permit through the core, you've triggered some individual review by the core. Um, it depends on the whether there's an existing dock there and you just want to amend it or whether you're building a dock from scratch without any permitting history. But the time frame for approval can be six to nine months minimum. At, at least for coastal areas, probably in the the lakes and rivers, freshwater, it's dealing with DHEC navigable waters in the core, it's probably more like three to six months, but in coastal areas, it can extend. Compliance and enforcement. DHEC has a very active compliance department. The Corps of Engineers has a very active compliance. Um, you don't want to run afoul the core of the with the Corps of Engineer regulations. You don't want to inherit a problem um, and a lack of compliance with the Corps because the Corps under federal law can issue um, extensive fines, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 a day, each day of the penalty is considered, each day of the violation is considered a separate violation. So the penalties accumulate. DHEC has limited fining authority, but, but they will use it and, um, and they're out there looking all the time to see if things haven't been built properly. The, another thing to understand is the concept of grandfathering. There are many docks that predate existing regulations. There are lots of pieces of property that predate existing dock restrictions. So understanding the benefits of grandfathering. And then we've had three named storms in three years, um, Matthew, Joaquim, and Irma. And they've done significant damage up and down the coastline with regard to dock structures and marina structures and knowing what, what accommodations the agencies can make uh, post-storm, which might make everybody's life a little bit easier. Permit expiration date is important for us to discuss because it's not always what it says on the face of the permit. I uh, mentioned due diligence. Part of that also is considering escrow issues um, for permitting or compliance um, that, that could arise it, to keep the deal going. Um, modifications to existing docks are possible and easier to obtain than full-scale permitting, as I mentioned. And then there's other options. There's marketing of communities that have community marinas and community docks where you can have a dedicated slip. So if you've got if you've got a client who says, I want to have a place to put my boat, you're not limited to neighborhoods with houses platted on creeks and rivers. You could look for some of these communities and there's, there's many of them. So these are, the in, these are the three entities that you have to watch out for that have interest in docks. Corps of Engineers, DHEC we've discussed, but believe it or not, there's some pesky little local governments out there that also want to regulate docks and their regulations are inconsistent with state and federal regulation, but still lawful because you can always ask, be more restrictive than the state or fed. You just can't be less restrictive. And these will come and bite you if you don't check and see what the municipality does in terms of issuing building permits for docks. Um, so I'll be using terms like general permit or GP and individual permit. A, a general permit is a tool used by regular, regulatory agencies 
that automatically covers certain activities. You don't submit a permit application. You submit a pre-construction notification that's evaluated to see if you qualify for the existing permit coverage in the general permit. And very thankfully, the Corps of Engineers uses general permits for, for residential docks. And that saves everybody a lot of time and a lot of money because the application process with the Corps of Engineers can be very protracted and expensive. Um, so the general permit covers all docks permitted by DHEC, but then there's specific exceptions that still have general permits, but you have to go to the lake or water body specific general permit with your pre-construction notification. Um, it also covers anything in federal waters and on the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway, but there's conditions in these general permits specific to the Intercoastal water, Waterway that can be a trap for people. And that is um, understanding the Corps' role in navigable waters, uh, and in particular, the Intercoastal Waterway, which is, which is the federal channel. Um, back in the 30s, I think, the state of South Carolina and all coastal states on the eastern seaboard uh, gave or allowed to be condemned vast areas of marsh um, for the dredging and creation of the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway. And um, the, 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 the Corps' specific concerns are that they are federally mandated to maintain the federal channel the intercoastal waterway and the channels that take you into the harbors of all these eastern seaboard states. They are federally authorized. They receive extensive amounts of federal funding for that function. And therefore, they adhere to rigorous setbacks from the edge of the channel. And the edge of the channel is where the dredge, the, 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 the deep dredged area is. It's where the dredge goes. And the Corps' biggest nightmare, well, there's two of them, is, is that it's going, its dredge is going to be too close to private property. It's going to damage a private dock, and the federal government will face some kind of liability for that. And secondly, that it's going to run out of places to dump the material when it maintains the waterway. So if you're in the coastal areas, you see all these spoil islands in and around the harbor these kind of yucky little places where sand has piled up and created very nice land. Eventually it becomes very nice land. And you're wondering, wonder why somebody can't buy that little island and use it for development. And it is because the Corps of Engineers will never, let's say rarely ever let go of its ownership of a spoil island uh, because you've got to have a place to put the sediment when you maintain the channel. So my point here is channel maintenance is a big deal. And if you've got a client buying on the federal channel, you want to see that core map. You want to see where the channel boundary is. And you want to see documentation that you have adhered to the offset because the core will find you, they will get you, and they will make you move that dock if it doesn't adhere to the offset. And you will have no defense. Um, let's see. There's other conditions on the, the general permits. And what this helps you understand is the interplay between permitting regulatory agencies, DHEC and the Corps, and consultative resource agencies. And there's a number of those. And they're involved in every permitting process, either by pre-action, where they commented and helped create the general permit before it was applied and used in projects, or through the public notice procedure of permits that go on public notice. Um, so there's a manatee condition on all of the core general permits. Why a manatee condition? Well, there's a Marine Mammal Act that is administered by NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, through NIMFS. National Marine Fisheries Service. And they are continuous participants in the permit process. And so every permit that the Corps issues, aside from a myriad of other conditions, is going to have conditions that protect natural resources. And the ones that show up in the general permit are the manatee conditions. So now we go to DHEC regulations, understanding that DHEC, either through the Navigable Waters Act, or 
the um, OCRM, coastal, the critical area regulations, is going to regulate all dock construction. Um, let's talk about critical area for a little bit. Uh, it's got a definition. Uh, why is this important? Well, understanding the definition, um, you know that it, it that the boundary isn't always where the agency says it is. It's generally defined as coastal waters, tidelands, and beaches, which includes mudflats and marshy areas. But it says nothing in this definition shall, shall apply to wetland areas that are not an integral part of the estuarine system, which means this is this really goes more toward like where the critical line is on the property than dock permitting, but it's it's important to understand. You know, there is a point where somebody may still be on the water and there may still be marsh, but it may not be an integral part of the estuarine system. It may be too far removed. It may be more freshwater influenced. It's always worth questioning. Um, I went out to visit somebody who has a dock in the city of Georgetown, and I, I guess it's the Sampit River. I, I don't remember the river. But I'm so used to the very tidal environment that I was shocked. It was like children of the corn. It was like these big stalks of freshwater vegetation. It was all, it was just scary looking surrounding the dock on either side. It wasn't a beautiful marsh, Spartina marsh, and there were alligators everywhere. And I said, this is not critical area. OCRM should not be regulating this dock. It's too freshwater. But there's also a geographic definition and it's an approximate description of the boundary. And it's anything, basically it's anything on the Western side of Highway 17 may not be critical area, but everything on the Eastern side of Highway 17 is critical area. And this guy was on the Eastern side of Highway 17, even though it couldn't have been more freshwater environment. And gosh, I don't even know why you want a dock that the alligators can swim up on, but that's what we were dealing with in that situation. Um, so, the regulations governing docks specifically define docks and boats and boat storage structures. And the reason they do that is because there's square foot limitations on docks and people try to get around them all the time. And they try to get around them by claiming that these drive on jet floats, which are essentially pontoon type floats, are boats because you can stick an outboard on them and they would be self-propelled. And that's the definition of a boat. And because people are able to get US Coast Guard hull IDs and stickers and put them on these jet floats. But what they're really using them for is boat storage. But they've already exceeded the square foot limitation on their dock. So they're pulling it up there, driving their boat on it, but claiming it is a boat itself. So OCRM does have these definitions. And you as agents need to be wary of selling property that has a dock that might have these structures, these jet float structures, because a lot of them are out there without permits and OCRM will find them eventually. Um, it's also important to understand dock master planning. Dock master planning is where the developer goes to meet with OCRM before the lat lots are platted um, to, to maximize his water frontage, get as many waterfront lots as he can, but also dock master planning will let you take a lot that doesn't meet the regulatory definition of dock, of waterfront, and yet it can be deemed waterfront. And you're going to see an examples, many examples of this regulatory definition. This is an important definition, um, and it's important to understand it when you're evaluating property. But it's also important to know when you're selling property in a subdivision that was constructed in the 90s or 2000s, it may have a dock master plan. Now, for that dock master plan to be enforceable, it had to have been recorded. And we're finding more and more, when you think about it, the developer has a lot of obligations as he's developing property. And then those obligations transfer to a POA or they transfer to a home builder. And we're finding if it wasn't recorded when it was initially approved with the successive generations of people who are in charge, it's overlooked. Uh, it is not enforceable if it's not recorded. You might ask when somebody's doing a title search, um, did they check for the recorded doc master plan? 
Um, but it, it's important to know if you think you're waterfront and you meet the waterfront test and you're not shown on the plan and it is recorded, you're not going to get a permit. So the, the plan, the dot master plan is very important. Um, so you know it when you see it, right? Look at this. This has to be waterfront property. And it may be, but you'd be surprised what isn't waterfront property. And I run into this issue uh, regularly. And it's the first evaluation you do for somebody if they're looking to purchase property that doesn't have a dock and they want to get a dock. There's a regulation, I'm going to butcher it if I don't have it in front of me, but it's the definition of waterfront property. And it's basically you, you take the, the property corners at the critical line, which is effectively where the marsh begins before you get to the water. And you do straight line extensions. What that means is you have to follow the distance and bearing of the line that went from the street to the water. So you don't get to draw it any way you want. You have to draw it at that angle. Those lines cannot cross before they get to the water. So they have to run like beautiful parallel lines. Then you have to have 75 feet of water frontage at the critical line and 75 feet of water frontage or of water of space between your extended property line in the in the water in order to get a dock. If you are dealing with a lot pre-93, subdivided pre-1993, that still doesn't have a dock, which would be surprising, you don't have to meet the 75 foot of water frontage criterion, but you still have to meet the definition of extended property lines using the bearings of the high ground lines that do not converge at the water. All right, I'm moving on to some crudely done uh, using Charleston County GIS imagery to sort of give you an example of what is and what is not um, waterfront. Um, so this one might be a no-brainer, but do you see the numbers 1172 on the left-hand side of the picture? That parcel is not waterfront. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The owner of that parcel is going to call me and want to try to get a dock because at high tide, what looks like is barely a creek is probably full of water. He probably walks out in his backyard and can see fish jumping, and he believes he's entitled to a dock. But the reality there may not be the property lines, which are oddly configured, but it may be that it has to extend to a navigable water body. and and the high tide measurement is not a measurement of navigable water body. So that's one of the one of the elements of the regulation is you have to get to a navigable water body. But look at 1265 on the other side. You know why 1265 isn't waterfront is somebody's got a little parcel of upland that runs along the length of 1265 and 1261. Let's assume the lower reaches of that stream before it reaches the, the, the bigger creek where the docks are, is navigable. Well, those, those property lines, you don't even have to try to extend them um, because uh, there's an intervening piece of property which might come to a, as a surprise to those property owners. So that's one example of the contortions you do in the analysis. Um, if you look at this picture, every, again, we've got the same problem. There's a few lots north of Cottage Drive, Cottage Road, I'm sorry, 1158 and 1154 that probably see a significant amount of water at high tide back up in that street stream, but would not be considered navigable water um, when you extended their property lines. But you see beautiful property lines on the other side of Cottage Road extending to the creek. And it's clear that all of these lots are going to be waterfront. Those are straight lines. You can extend them. They run parallel. Those, the, the, the property lines on either side as they go out to the water run parallel. And there's no convergence. So those are beautifully platted waterfront lots. You don't see that all the time, however. You're, you're going to you need to do this analysis. All right, here's the definition that I kind of butchered. Um, Waterfront property is defined as upland sites where a straight line extension of both shore perpendicular 
upland property lines reach a navigable water course within a thousand feet. I forgot the thousand feet. That's pretty significant. Um, if you're more than a thousand feet from the water, it doesn't matter how beautifully parallel your upland property lines are. And then, of course, waterfront property may be identified via a dock master plan. Um, here's another one. Let's look at one, two, three, five, parcel one, two, three, five. Um, and I'll show you the next slide to show you what I mean about extended property lines. But um, parcel one, two, three, five probably doesn't have 75 feet at the critical line because of the configuration of those lines, but let's assume it predates that requirement. So the next question is, when you extend the lines, can you get to water without converging? So we go to the next slide, and this was my inartful attempt, but it, it's not bad to take the bearing and extend the straight lines from both those upland lines. I might have not done such a good job on the left-hand side, but, but a surveyor can do this and do it very quickly and very well. But clearly these lines, because of the bearing of the line between 1235 and 1233, these lines are gonna cross well before you get to water. Consequently, 1235 fails the test as waterfront property. Um, you come down here. This is another example. 1552 probably is going to fail the test for the same reason. That shared extension with 1548 there in the middle of the page. The bearing of that line, the angle of that line, when you draw it straight out, it's going to converge with um, the angle of the line drawn straight out for on the other side of 1552. And yet he's surrounded by docks. He's surrounded by water. So it's going to be, I, I assume it's a he, maybe it's a she. It's going to be tough telling this person, no, you're not going to get a dock. You don't have waterfront property. So that's, a, that's an important evaluation um, to do. Some additional very important criteria for dock permitting. Well, let's go back a minute. Let's talk about extended property lines. So everything is based on the extensions of property lines, not the property lines themselves, but the red lines on this slide and how they extend. And so what it starts to do is it starts to give waterfront property owners a feeling that they own that property encompassed between those extended lines. Their dock drawings have to show those line extensions. The dock has to be located appropriately within those line extensions. And waterfront property owners began believing or begin believing that that's their property. That piece of the water is their property. And that's where all the conflict arises. Some subdivisions, they actually extend the upper boundary lot line on a plat all the way to the water. They attempt to plat the property all the way out to the mean, mean low water line, past mean high water into mean low water, where all the docks are located. I don't know why they do that, but that also creates this notion amongst property owners that they have an ownership interest in that portion of the river. They do not. Nobody owns the river. Um, for various planning tools or whatever, sometimes upland lines are extended out to the river or even platted out to the river, but it is no reflection on any ownership beyond the critical line. Okay, we've talked about this one. So the additional criteria that can come back and bite you, you only get one dock per parcel. So uh, don't think that you can buy some big piece of property and put two or three docks on it unless you subdivide it. Um, you um, can't be longer than a thousand feet. You've got to extend to the first navigable water body. Sometimes you can skip over it, but it's quite a process to do so. So what you've got is somebody that can look at the Beaufort River is a good example and think I have riverfront property, but they go to permit the dock and they're gonna put them at a 30 foot wide creek that's a uh, stone's throw away from the Beaufort River through a little bit of marsh. It's very, it's very difficult to jump over those creeks. Um, you have to show that access is impaired in the creek and all your anti-development crowd and anti-dock crowd is suddenly gonna get their kayak out there and use the creek on a regular basis. 
and you're not going to be able to jump over. So knowing that your waterfront and then understanding where your waterfront rights will take you is critical in the evaluation of the property. Um, I talked about the 75 foot of water frontage joint use docks, which seemed like a good idea, but I don't know in, in practicality, you don't see that many of them and I don't know how well it works because it requires successive neighbors to get along and like each other and work together on maintenance issues. But with joint use docks, two, you can, you can uh, make smaller lots, only have 50 feet of water frontage and two adjoining lots can share a dock if they each have 50 feet. No docks on creeks less than 10 feet wide and docks on creeks less than 20 feet wide only if you have 500 feet of water frontage and no possibility of docks on the other side. So effectively, it's very hard to get a dock on a creek that is less than 20 feet wide. Um, and you're not going to get one on a creek less than 10 feet wide. Um, and I've actually, we've actually litigated these issues. People actually get competing surveyors out there. Um, and one will say it's 10.2 feet and the other is going to say it's 9.8 feet. And it's up to the judge to figure out if you can qualify for a dock. So this is, a, you know, people, people will go to extraordinary, through extraordinary means if it means that they can have a dock and have a boat where they originally thought that they couldn't. Um, let's talk about square footage. It's based on creek width, 120 square feet for the smaller creeks, 160 square feet for the medium creeks, and 600 for the larger creeks as defined by 150 feet or greater in width. You can measure it off of Google Earth, very easy. It's not a lot of space. On a creek 51 to 150 feet wide, you get 160 square feet. That means a 8 by 10 pier head and an 8 by 10 floating dock. Um, there are ways to get more square footage. It's called whether you've got special geographic circumstances. It works in Beaufort County because it works where there's a high tidal range. Whether you've got 500 feet of water frontage, that's not going to apply very often. Um, and no possibility of dockage on the other side. That can apply because there can be too much marsh over 1,000 feet and there may be no possibility of docking on the other side. Dock measurements. Do not include the walk. Remember the cartoon I showed you. You don't measure the walkway, the catwalk, the ramps, the mooring buoys, and the mooring piles. You just measure the area of the pier heads, any roofed area, the area of the floating docks, and the boat storage area. But you're going to very quickly get to those thresholds that I showed you. Um, well, I better not misquote them. 120, 160, and 600. You can get to those pretty quickly. Why do we have these regulations? Because it's public property and we're protecting its use for the public. That's why we keep people only having what's reasonable for their intended use. Um, now you're gonna see grandfathered structures that are larger, much larger, built back in the 70s, predate regulation, much larger than what is allowed. They cannot be enlarged. You cannot add to them. Um, and there's this funky little rule that says, on, on creeks less than 50 feet, you get a freebie. You get one boat storage structure, eight by 20 or less, that will not count against your square footage. And you get two of them, or two times eight by 20, um, on creeks 51 feet or wider. So there's a few, there's some good news. Briefly looking, all right, so that was my recitation on OCRM regulations within DHEC, complicated, a little more detailed. Now, navigable waters, very general performance standards. All they're trying to do is protect navigability. They want to make sure you have a duty to maintain your dock. You can't let it fall apart and float out into the channel. And they want to make sure your dock is reasonable outside of the critical area, outside of the tidal areas and so that navigability in those water bodies are protected. That is the sole goal of the regulation. No specific standards, just performance standards. This is where I get irritated, local government. I've run into it twice. It probably exists more than twice and you real, it needs to be part of your due diligence. What, do you, what is applied when, you, what, uh, what standards are applied when you go get a building permit for this dock? You need to know that going in because I have so many clients that get blindsided. Sullivan's Island has a very restrictive regulation. It's on the intercoastal waterway, big, wide water. 
but it will not allow any dock to extend past any other dock. They all have to line up. I think they just want a nice, neat line when everybody's looking at them from the air. What's silly about that is mean high water, mean low water, all of the things that dictate navigation, they don't line up. They meander through the stream. So it's a very arbitrary restriction. It, it limits the value of very expensive property. It limits your access significantly to the intercoastal waterway because you are mooring your boat behind a sandbar. I mean, I'm not upset about it or anything. You, maybe you didn't detect that in my tone of voice. Beaufort County did another crazy thing. It adopted a small tidal creek ordinance. It doesn't really have a definition of a tidal creek. It created a map. That map is only located one place. You might be able to find it online, but normally you have to walk into the Beaufort County planning office to look at the map to find out what is a small tidal creek. And then if it takes you more than 300 feet to get to that small tidal creek, you can't have a dock. Now the thing is with a seven foot tidal range, which is what we have in Beaufort County and south of there, those tidal creeks probably afford significant water access, but the county has decided you can't have a dock. So everybody needs to beware, be watchful, and understand what local government um, requires. I've run into problems with historic design review boards. I've gotten permits through DHEC, through the Corps, and then the building official says we have to go let the historic design review board look at it. And a lot of these coastal towns have a lot of history and apply these standards and they're not real fond of docks which is silly because the history they're trying to preserve was a time when transportation by boat was um, the significant form of transportation so one more thing you got to worry about um, regulatory processes i think i've gone over this but understanding the public notice general public notice going to all resource agencies all interested agencies and specific notice going to adjoining property owners, which gives adjoining property owners the opportunity to make the permit process complicated as they look out for their own interests with the building of the dock. The comment periods of 15 to 30 days, the review period by the agency, which can pend for six to nine months, the request by the agency for the applicant to respond to comments, and then after that, that the fact that every DHEC decision can be challenged, an administrative appeal can be filed. And, and believe me, those appeals are not rare. They happen kind of on a regular basis. Um, Post-storm accommodations, there is an emergency general permit available. It, it's good until 2022. It lets you build back what you had, previously permitted or grandfathered structures. Um, they're going after people who took all kind of liberties building back more than what they had. If you are involved in a transaction associated with a piece of property that um, they just rebuilt the dock because of the three named storms um, under the general permit, you want to confirm, and you can do it on Google Earth, that they didn't build back more than they had. Because the tendency once the dock builder gets out there is why don't we add a little of this and a little of that? And DHEC is catching it. DHEC has all the aerial imagery that we have plus some, and it's easy for them now to detect violators. So transactional issues associated with docks. Um, permit expiration date, very important. Uh, in, so permits are generally good for five years, dock permits. But the legislature during the recession told or stayed all development approvals through that were alive at 1108 through 123112. So you had a five year permit issued in 2007. Only one year of it was used. You tack when the, when the tolling affected it, you tack five more years on it at the end of 12 and you've got a permit running to the beginning of 18 or the end of 17. That was all well and good till we got into 2018. But in 13, the legislature did it again, realizing that we weren't raising capital fast enough to take advantage of all these entitlements that we had, even though we were coming out of the recession, they did it again. So the permit that might have been issued 1117 does not expire until 2021. Sooner or later, we're going to hit 2021 and we're going to not have this benefit, but this has been a huge benefit. So don't freak out if your seller 
hands you a permit and hasn't built the dock yet, and it looks like it's expired on its face. Check to see the, the application of the joint resolutions. Um, what do I think is a significant due diligence period um, to, to, to address some of these issues that I've identified? Um, well, I know that if the permit's contingent on the dock, you're gonna have to build in the permitting time, which can be three, six, three months, three to six months, nine months, just depending on where you are. You know, you can get a feel for that from the project manager at the agency who might have the permit application, but you're gonna have to build in time. There's opportunities during that period to be relatively assured that you're gonna get the permit. If no objections are received, that's a really good sign. And the, the project managers are very generous with their time. And if they know a transaction is kind of dependent on this, they can say, hey, you meet all the rules and regulations. I don't have time to write you a permit right now. We haven't concluded this process. But if you meet all the rules and regulations, I will write you a permit. So there's a way to eliminate some of the risk and some of the uncertainty. But understand, if there are objections and you have a contingent contract, and there are appeals, you are buying litigation when you buy that property. And that an administrative appeal can render uncertainty for at least another year after it's issued because of the, the, the time it takes to get through one of those appeals. Um, I've, I've been asked this question before, I'm not a good expert on this, but um, you know, typically the way you manage risk in a transaction or one of the ways is with an escrow. So what's, you know, so something comes up about the dock that doesn't feel right or the dock permit application, what what do you factor in for the escrow? I mean, if it's a liability problem, you can escrow funds for the cost of removal or cost of compliance. If it's a potential legal challenge, you can escrow, fun, escrow funds for the cost of the appeal. If you're stand to lose the dock, you can adjust the purchase price or 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 the escrow can be dictated based on the impact on fair market value. So there, you know, there are ways to manage the risk and let the transaction go through, but nobody's going to be very happy about it. Um, I've, I've told you this, aggressive compliance, aggressive compliance, and it doesn't matter how old the violation is. There are statutes of limitations, both with the core and with DHEC, but they have lots of loopholes. They don't always apply nicely to everybody. So you just need to do the appropriate amount of investigation to ensure that somebody's not buying a compliance problem. And then if they are buying a potential compliance problem, that you've handled that through whatever means you manage risk in the transaction. Um, you buy a piece of property with a dock and maybe you don't like the exact way the dock looks. It is easier to modify or amend a dock in accordance with the regulations, assuming you're not being unusual, I mean, unreasonable then to start anew. So that process is likely not going to take the nine months. It will take three to six months. And you can receive the same kind of assurances as you go through that process and maybe not hold up a transaction just for a permit modification. Again, community mortgage. Uh, be aware that those that there is that opportunity. Um, DHEC can direct you to uh, the particular developments in areas that have the community mortgage and the reserve slips for particular home sites. Um, it's a quick understanding. I'm running out of time here and I want to leave time for questions, but understanding the difference between the role of administrative agencies, and it goes back to the Constitution and the separation of powers and the three branches of government. The Corps of Engineers and DHEC are separate administrative agencies, part of separate executive branches. The state of South Carolina's executive branch and the United States government's executive branch. The governor appoints the DHEC director. The president appoints the officers that are in charge of the Corps of Engineers. So that's the administrative agency. So permit appeals are not, you don't go to the courthouse for a permit appeal. They are administrative appeals. They are administrative proceedings. It's a little bit different from judicial pr proceedings. The judicial courts have a role, but not the role of like the contested hearing, the trial, the qualification of witnesses. That all lies with the administrative law judge, not a jury, not a judge in the judiciary, but an administrative law judge hears these appeals at the administrative law court in Columbia. 
and determines effectively whether the evidence shows that the agency followed its rules and regulations. Then that decision can be appealed to the South Carolina Court of Appeals and the South Carolina Supreme Court. And, and then the court performs, a ju the judicial court performs a judicial review to make sure everybody's rights were adhered to and all the laws were followed, but does not do what they call a de novo hearing, which is what you envision when you think about, you know, going to the courthouse. Um, it's important to understand that agencies have all kind of internal review procedures. DHEC has its own internal review procedure called a, uh, you have to file um, a request for final review conference with DHEC before you can even go to the administrative law court. It's jurisdictional. Um, so understanding that's the role of administrative agencies. Now, they, these things, I don't want to discourage anybody, but it's, it's a hotbed of litigation. And I've just listed some of the cases that I'm intimately familiar with. And it's over the silliest of stuff. Um, it's over, I think that dock's gonna affect my ability to get my boat to my dock. That's the Dorman v. Heck and Mall v. Heck case. And the court finally said, you know what, if you're a bad boat pilot, <laughs> that's not OCRM's problem. Um, we don't think OCR, the court said, OCRM's laws are not to resolve navigational disputes between private citizens, but, they are there to resolve navigational disputes, and this is White versus DHEC, uh, with, um, when the public is involved, when, a, when a, uh, something commercial is involved effectively. There's a case that says you can have your equal protection denied if your rights to a dock aren't, if you're similarly situated to another waterfront property owner and you don't get exactly what they get, that's a denial of equal protection. That's the, the Weaver case. Um, there's a case that says there is no littoral right to wharf, wharf out. That was over West Ashley. In the, the first slide I started out with, the Low Country Open Land Trust owns all that marsh. And they've sort of grandfathered the docks that existed before they got the deed. And, it, and it's a deed that they can trace back to a sovereign's grant before the land trust got the deed to the marsh. But somebody named Atkins tried to get a dock. And it was the, the land trust said, no, that marsh is our property. You can't have a dock. Um, and that went all the way to the uh, South Carolina Supreme Court. And then finally, there's this case about Captain Sam Spit that was not about a dock, but was about um, the importance of public trust resources and that public trust resources. It, it was this it was kind of this swing of the pendulum back to we're no longer gonna sacrifice public trust resources for other people's economic gains. So it was a very sweeping affirmation of the rights of the public to public marsh, public oyster grounds, public waterways. And, and it might be something that's used in the future for some unpopular dock contest, as a dock permit as a basis for challenge. So I'm gonna stop now. By my clock, we've got about seven minutes left for questions, and um, I've enjoyed talking to all of y'all this afternoon. All right, thanks, Mary. Um, we're going to take a few seconds to see if anybody has any questions for you. While we're waiting, I want to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube page. You can find all of our webinars at youtube.com slash screaltors or at screaltors.org slash webinar. And it does look like we have a couple questions. So let me read them off for you. Um, can you cross the extended property, property line even a small amount with the permission of a neighbor whose line you might cross? Yes. There's no prohibition on crossing extended property lines as long as there's, they say, no material harm to the policies of the act, which effectively means you're not blocking anybody's navigation. So yes, and you don't need the neighbor's permission. It's right. nice to get it. We've got one more. Um, is a surveyor the best professional to utilize to help guide a buyer through the process, or is there a need for someone with additional qualifications or training? A surveyor can definitely bring certainty to the question of waterfront 
property, surveyors are very familiar, surveyors, most surveyors are very familiar with DHEX regulations because they're licensed professionals and they're supposed to be familiar and how it affects the permit process. So that that is a good person, but there's also a lot of permitting consultants out there who specifically deal with dot permitting. So you're not limited to just a surveyor, but that is an appropriate person to, to do an inquiry for you. All right, um, we've got another one. How do we contact you if our buyers need legal help with dot permits? Do you handle these type of legal issues and do you handle these type of issues for coastal areas and lakes and rivers? Yes, all of the above. Um, I'm very accessible usually. I, I It's not unusual to get calls from real estate professionals when a deal starts to blow up and, and guide buyer and seller through it. And um, my email is on the, and my phone number are listed on the last slide. Hello. All right, Mary, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. So I just want to thank you for taking the time to present today. Um, and oh, we just had a question come in. Um, does the property owner have to own the property that the dock is attached to? No, the property owner has to demonstrate ownership, leasehold interest, or permission to get a dock. Does not have to own it. All righty. Well, thank you, Mary. Um, it's been a pleasure having you present for us today. And um, thank you to everybody for tuning in. This webinar will be up on our website shortly. And I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon.